So my name's Heidi Eschwacker. I'm the origination manager at Invenergy covering SPP. And ERCOT, um, Invenergy is a privately held development company where we not only develop projects, but we also construct, own, and operate. Um, over the past 20 years, we've developed over 30 gigawatts. And in Nebraska specifically, we operate five wind farms that total just over 800 megawatts. And um, our first project was Prairie Breeze in 2014. Um, so here to speak on the topic of new energy blows through, new technology blows through wind energy development are Michael Knapp and, well, Bryant, if you're here, come on up. Um, so Michael Knapp is the COO at Sand Hills Energy. He oversees local, state, federal permitting and manages third-party services and reviews coordinates execution of all corporate agreements. He is responsible for all contractual obligations and administrative compliance. Michael has extensive experience executing permitting under accelerated timelines and conflictual activism. Yeah, my name is Michael Knapp. I'm COO of Sandhills Energy. That's an increasingly um, inappropriate title for me. Uh, we've recently hired two folks to take off jobs that I do as I return to uh, being a primary wind energy developer. Um, in light of the IRA, that, that's moving again. So we've Sandhills Energy started uh, in Cherry County, Nebraska um, in wind, utility scale wind. We've moved into utility scale solar. We have um, <clears throat> close to a gigawatt of solar projects in Nebraska in the queue. Um, and we've now kind of expanded downwards. We've uh, acquired a CNI solar company and we do municipal as well. We have 23 uh, municipal projects across Iowa, Nebraska, and Colorado um, with MEAN currently in development. So I'm going to kind of have a discursive conversation today about, uh, I was asked to talk about recent innovations in wind turbine technology. Um, I buy wind turbines. I don't sell them. I don't design them. Uh, so uh, this is all kind of third hand, a lot of the stuff that I'll be talking about. And we'll just uh, keep it light and breezy. And uh, so, so what's changed in uh, wind turbine technology? Well, first, very little. Um, and then actually also a lot. So we're in a strange place as far as turbine technology goes. Um, this morning, uh, today is my son Huck's uh, birthday. He turns three today. And my wife heard him waking up, stirring in his bed. So she went in and she said, happy birthday. And he said, I'm three? And she said, you're three. And he said, oh, I thought I'd be bigger. <laughs> and that's more or less the state of wind turbine technology. Uh, this is the 15th annual Nebraska conference. I thought, I thought wind turbines would be bigger. Um, they're getting there, but they're not quite there yet. So very little, right? You know, you Google wind turbine uh, innovations and you, you see all these crazy designs. Uh, that people have been proposing for 20 years and nobody's building, right? It's still steel monopole, three blade, you know, active facing. There's no radical redesigns uh, in sight. That's misspelled. Good job, Michael. Misspelled that one. Uh, right, what was the 20, what was the top selling turbine in 2021? Any guesses? The classic, the GE 127 2 megawatt, 2021. Top selling turbine, right? The one we all know and love, the GE 127 2 megawatt. Like, that's not a lot of change. That, that, that guy's been around, right? Um, you know, 80 meter hub height, all the stuff that we know really well. Um, so, why? Why was that? Well, the problems that have been facing, uh, you know, the wind industry haven't really changed all that much over the past, say, five years, right? We have grid con congestion, we have extended GIA queues, those are slowly coming down. Uncertain upgrade costs, right? That puts a damper on all of us. And most clearly, the uncertain regulatory and tax subsidy environment, right? So uh, in 2019, for the turbine manufacturers, the whole deal was, was the PTC cliff, right? They're, they had all of the innovations that we're gonna see already in their pipeline, but they had no reason to go through those. What, they, what mattered to them was getting the turbines out the door so that they could be safe harbored in 2019, right? And that put a real damper on innovation. They just needed to produce to meet that cliff. Once they got through that cliff, what happened? COVID, right? 
and a very uncertain future for what the tax and, and subsidy and uh, regulatory environment would be. That has recently changed, right? As we all know, now we have the IRA. So there's a whole new set of issues that the turbine manufacturers are facing with that. So all of that put a damper on. Their whole, their whole job was to get turbines out the door in 2019 and then wait and see. Um, so now we're starting to see some announcements of, of new turbines, but, but there really hasn't been in the past five years. So what are we seeing now? Yep, they are actually getting bigger, right? They sure are. So this is uh, from a Nordex slide. You could get this from Siemens, GE, Nextera, or, or Vestas. Um, they all have this. So they, this is a, a five megawatt class, the Delta 4000. They've actually, Nordex has since expanded the Delta 4000 to six megawatt class and seven megawatt class. Um, all of the manufacturers have this, right? We're getting bigger, we're getting much larger uh, blades, much taller, and that allows us to get into much lower uh, density, mean density power areas. So, oh. so yeah, so we have tip heights are gonna reach 700 feet pretty soon. They're already in the 670 range. Um, nameplate trend has finally passed three megawatt as, as far as average. Um, and then, yeah, they, all the manufacturers have their seven megawatt platforms. Um, the Vestas Inventus, the GE Cypress, the Nordex Delta 4000. Um, one interesting thing that did happen in 2020 is the 500 foot height restriction actually finally flipped. Um, so in 2019, it, uh, roughly, these are very rough figures, about 80% of uh, installed capacity going in that year was under the 500 foot limit. Um, and only 20% was over. That flipped in 2020, it's now 80% over and 20% under. And it's really um, legacy projects uh, that you're seeing that are still under that 500, or if you're actually in the area of an airport. Um, the, turns out the, the penalty with the FAA and with regulation was not that severe for breaking that 500 foot ceiling. So, now let's look at the units themselves. Um, there have been unit improvements recently, so GE in particular has led the charge on increased recyclability of parts. Um, there's also been uh, radar si lighting systems. Some of the manufacturers are pursuing that themselves. Uh, that's often a third party. I think uh, Bryant might be talking more about that. And then we're seeing, uh, this isn't on here, but GE in particular has a two-piece blade, um, and really, it's the question for the for for all of this that's not on the slides is you know what problems are we solving for? Um, you know what problems as a developer am I solving for? I'm solving for regulation. I'm solving for site-specific questions. What are the what are the turbine manufacturers solving for? They're solving for logistics. They're solving for supply chain. Um, they're solving for manufacturing. Uh, right now, they're solving for the IRA. So uh, we're going to have, in 2022, we'll have fewer installs than in, or, than in 2021. In 2023, we'll have fewer still. Um, that's kind of scary for our turbine manufacturers. They're announcing layoffs. I recently was looking at a, a, a profit report, or rather not, uh, profit report for one of the manufacturers, and I was stunned by it that they could stand a whole quarter with that. And then I realized, or I stand a whole year, and then I was looking at it and said, oh, that's actually the first quarter of this year. I thought they were reporting their losses for last year, and they were reporting their losses for the first quarter of this year. So we're going to have fewer installs in 2022, fewer still in 2023, and then in 2024, right? Senator Manchin floats in on an effluvium of coal, frankincense, and myrrh, and we all genuflect and throw up as many turbines as we possibly can, right? So how do the turbine manufacturers deal with that, right? They're announcing layoffs while trying to vastly expand their manufacturing, right? So they have to innovate on their side of the business in a way that we're not even gonna see, right? And what that means for the turbines kind of still remains to be seen. Um, so as you get bigger, so there's other problems they're solving for, mainly logistics, right? As you get bigger uh, with your turbines, the roads don't, 
right? You're, we're running into a, a real problem with that. You can only go so big with your blades and your base tower porch sections and still get those down the road. So they're trying to solve for that in a number of different ways. GE has their two-piece blade, which is very innovative. Um, it's essentially their normal 127 meter blade with an extension with a carbon pin uh, that gets them out to 140 meters for their new larger turbines. They're also looking at, Nordex already has concrete uh, towers and concrete and steel towers that they do around the world. They haven't really done them here. Um, but all of the manufacturers are looking at at least that base section, that wide section that won't fit down the road if you're at a 700 foot tip height, uh, turning that into uh, concrete and steel so that you can, you can manufacture that on site. Um, GE also has, uh, they're looking at, they haven't announced, um, but they're looking at a rolled steel tower uh, that basically looks like uh, a paper towel roll or you know that old Pillsbury croissant that you would pop open with your spoon. So you just roll it up and then you weld that spiral and your tower is one piece and you can manufacture that on site. Uh, they said, that's at least five years out, but you can talk about it. <laughs> so, so I did that. Um, so, so that's what they're solving for. They're solving for logistics and, and Heidi and I were talking beforehand, you know, these, these new turbines, you need new cranes, you need new training for your, for your uh, construction guys. Um, so that's, the, that's a lot of where the innovation is happening right now. Um, you then are also seeing a lot of innovation at, at the plant level. Uh, so this isn't so much turbine uh, innovation as, as plant innovation. I'm sure many of you have seen the, the recent uh, MIT uh, study where they optimized the plant uh, with some counterintuitive measures, right? They, the front leading turbines, they turned 20% away from the wind uh, and that created a 3% increase in the overall plant generation um, because it allowed the, the following turbines to get more of that wind and they could utilize it better. Um, so treating the whole plant as a unit, uh, which we used to not do, it was just, you know, maximize every turbine. Getting more, uh, um, seeing more complexity in, in uh, wind, wind wake loss analysis. Also redesigning for, for P to X. So uh, as we've seen, right, grid congestion is a problem. So there's a lot of projects, particularly with hydrogen now, uh, that are looking to go off grid, just consume your energy on site. And once you do that, your consumption becomes part of your plant and you can actually redesign your turbine uh, and the, the electronics in your turbine, your drivetrain, um, your nacelle to sp specify it to the exact consumption case. Um, so I'm seeing that across the industry as well. And of course, redesigning for solar and storage co-deployment. Co I mean, that's, that's just everywhere. And finally, reactive power. Um, I don't, I'm not sure which one, one of, the, one of the manufacturers has recently announced their turbines uh, will have reactive power, which will be pretty nice. And lastly, uh, we have Wally here saying hi. Um, so there's been a lot of third party mitigations. So the problems that I solve for, right, are, are the classics, you know, endangered species, regulatory, uh, environment, environmental regulations, um, all that good stuff. So there's been a lot of uh, progress in deterrence and monitoring. Um, for bats and birds, you got, we're looking out for bats and birds in every way we know how, right? Radar, thermal, infrared, sonic, ultrasonic, deter both deterrence and monitoring. Um, this is Identiflight. This is a completely stolen image. Don't tell anybody. I put it up there. Um, so that, this is an AI system. They feed hundreds of thousands of images and videos of specific species of birds into their AI learning. And the program can then identify specific species. So you can train these systems to watch for uh, very specific species for each, um, each facility that you have. And then it will monitor them and, and you know, if something, if one of the uh, species individuals comes th comes nearby, they will uh, curtail your wind farm. Um, 
I want to talk to these guys about the whooping crane corridor. I don't know that we have hundreds of thousands of images and videos of whooping cranes. If there's enough to teach them about those, but that would be very, very helpful in Nebraska. Um, and then uh, lastly, sound reduction and production. Um, so lots of very interesting things here, especially offshore. Um, they're doing a lot of things of creating bubble walls around their construction. Uh, essentially, you know, creating noise to deter uh, mammal species, ocean mammals, uh, from from getting too close during construction. And they just, you know, a bubble curtain does a really good job with that. And lastly, I have on here artificial habitat. I completely forget what that means, guys. I don't know what that one means. So we'll have to look that one afterwards. Look that one up afterwards. So there's a lot that's happening. I think over the next few years, it's going to look a lot the same. Um, we're still going to see those, uh, those classic towers that we all know and love. Um, but following that, I think with the IRA and with the change in how that works in terms of we don't need a safe harbor anymore, we need domestic content, um, I think we're going to start to see some, some real change in what our turbines look like. Anyway, thanks, everybody. Okay, in place of Brian, we have Don, um, I already, Worth <laughs> from Orsted. So Orsted um, just went COD on their Haystack project. I think that's a 298 megawatt project in Wayne County. Um, and they are using the Siemens five megawatt um, turbines. So some of the questions we have for Don over here are, what issues during construction and did you have to get creative with these size turbines? Uh, howdy everyone, I'm subbing in here for Bryant, uh, so do forgive me. Uh, yeah, he's just uh, away for a different emergency. So, um, but yeah, excited to represent Orsted maybe before jumping into um, some questions. Um, uh, previous presentation really highlighted a couple of things that are uh, important for our Orsted. Orsted, we're operating stuff uh, across the U.S. Uh, you act, actually, if you ever see a photo of a, a wind turbine in the middle of the ocean, Orsted probably owns it. We're the world's largest offshore wind energy company. Um, that said, we're here in Nebraska. I grew up in the state of Oklahoma, landlocked state, Nebraska even more landlocked, and so uh, I won't talk about the ocean anymore. <laughs> and uh, and so that said, um, I represent, uh, or I'm on the development team and uh, based out of Texas, uh, but working on wind and solar projects across the US. And so our presence here in Nebraska being uh, two operating uh, sites, uh, one is Haystack, which just hit COD um, and has those large SGRE turbines that uh, we'll be discussing here in a bit. Uh, but also in Wayne County is the Plum Creek Wind Farm. Uh, it's 230 megawatts in size, and uh, uh, we'll actually have some of our plant managers join us a little bit later, and so um, they can, they're, they're the boots on the ground who can be able to speak to a lot of the uh, everyday items that are happening there. So that said, <laughs> moving into the question here. Uh, so the SGRE turbines, they're huge. Uh, five megawatts in size and uh, just really massive. And so uh, there's actually uh, 51 of them uh, at our Haystack uh, project. And so um, I know for us, uh, 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 many people I speak to, they, they ask about Oklahoma and Nebraska and think of it very flat. As you all know, there are lots of hills, especially in the eastern part of the states. And when we had to uh, navigate those, uh, pun intended, uh, 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 with the construction. Um, as you can imagine, a very long turbine in a in a very long hill uh, aren't a great mix. So uh, actually had to be uh, get creative with a lot of the uh, transportation logistics to get them out there in the first place. Um, turning radii had to be even larger. Uh, with those large uh, blades, but then also um, how to modify some of the roads so that we can transport them 
um, and then be able to uh, bring the roads back to the original condition uh, or, or better than the original condition. And so um, what are some of the other questions? So, so the other one was, do turbines of this size change the way we operate or fix them compared to turbines in the past? Um, so what's really exciting, and I think leaning on both the experience with our offshore wind team that have even larger turbines, I think some of the newer ones are getting up to uh, 15 megawatts per turbine in size. Um, uh, one of our currently operating sites on Rhode Island has a larger than five megawatt. And so what's nice is everything, all the maintenance that you do with one turbine, um, it's kind of that economies of scale where um, you can focus more of your efforts, be only instead of climbing uh, two different towers for five megawatts, you only have to climb one tower for five megawatts. So um, actually um, improves some of the amount of time you're devoting towards each uh, turbine. Um, that said, um, I can't speak to some of the uh, <laughs> other uh, operating um, aspects, unfortunately. Okay. And then since you are um, both developers, are there any other ways that you would permit these turbines differently or different environmental studies that you would have to go through because they are larger in size? Uh, mainly FAA. Once you break that 500-foot ceiling, um, you're into a different regulatory regime there. Um, and oftentimes, uh, you know, moving from, from smaller to larger. So that may be the trigger for, for a federal nexus, which then changes how you articulate, uh, with U S fish and wildlife and Nebraska game parks, um, because then you are getting a federal permit, um, under 500 foot doesn't really count as a federal permit. It's just a review. Um, but over seven, over 500 foot, you're pretty much ensured that that's going to count as a permit. And then you have a federal nexus. And then with the FAA, what are you finding their feedback on these larger turbines? Do they prefer more like taller turbines and less of them? Or um, does it just depend on where you guys are at? So the, the, the main difference is you go through a, a more extensive DOD siting review. Um, which in Nebraska is, is helicopter training routes. Um, and, and then you also have a public input period. So it takes a lot longer. Um, you have a public input period, which generally isn't that impactful, but you never know. Um, you know, Sandhills Energy fighting the Cherry County fight. Uh, we're once bitten, twice shy as far as public input goes. Um, so we take that very seriously. Um, those are the those are the main things, and you know, uh, a, a more fine tooth DoD review and a public public accounting. Okay, Donnie, I know. Yeah, ditto. It's uh, one of those situations where um, you know, once you go above that five hundred foot threshold, there's just additional hoops that you need to jump through, and so um, yeah, a lot of that public outreach aspects makes it to where everyone in the room here. Uh, who's a developer can appreciate uh, kind of how uh, that adds some complexity um, sometimes. And so just being aware of that, getting ahead of that within uh, both the community and, and also um, stakeholders from across the state, um, you just got to um, take those additional steps. And, and um, but yeah, a, a lot of similarities. Okay. Are there any questions from the audience? The ADLS system? Yeah, um, I can speak to that. Um, this is the uh, uh, ADL systems to make it to where we're not permanently having blinking lights uh, for for uh, wind farms is something that's really important to states, communities. Um, it's something that Orsted has on all of its uh, sites uh, across the U.S. Um, even some of our projects that we've acquired, we've retroactively installed ADLS because um, either it's a state uh, regulation, it's a local regulation, or it builds a lot of um, uh, uh, just, yeah, it builds, builds a lot of goodwill with the community. And so that's something that Orsted does, whether we're required to or not, is to install these uh, aircraft detection lighting systems on all their sites. That said, there are additional complexities that go with that. Um, with uh, to, to add another federal acronym, 
instead of the FAA, you work with the FCC um, to be able to uh, get some of these permitted. And so that's something that, as everyone in here who's a developer, if you're required to do it or if you're considering it for your different sites, that's something that um, is, is just to be like get out ahead of. <laughs> Because uh, similarly to an FAA process, it's a federal process. It's pretty straightforward with the FCC. That said, there's always potential th of things getting delayed, timeline slipping. And if this is a requirement for your projects uh, um, uh, at a local level within the county, uh, it's important to hit. But yeah, I really enjoy these. And definitely, uh, I know a lot of county commissioners and county staff and local uh, local stakeholders who get really excited to know that um, lights won't be blinking all night. I guess for someone who isn't a developer, how long is that timeline to go for that permit? Uh, at worst, nine months. Uh, typically, you can get through it about four months. Uh, I know for us, we're probably averaging about six months to just get through that full FCC process. So um, that's something to add to the ever-growing schedule and, and game chart for your development yeah. team. Yeah. All right. Any other questions out there? Did you ever tease out uh, something from one of your earlier slides about uh, how the plant operations are changing to uh, that on-site hydrogen generation? Is that, is that correct? Yeah, just, I mean, that was an example, so P to X. So that yeah. example, what I'd like to find out from that is, is the long-term view that those same plants would be grid ties, or could this be an economic development of its own? I think both. Um, you know, grid tie comes with its own issues, right? You're, yeah, right now, you're at a three-year three lead time to get your GIA at, at a minimum in, in, our, in our neck of the woods. Uh, so if you can get get off that, you can accelerate your timeline. Um, so, you know, but then then you have a host of other problems. So for hydrogen, right, you're not selling electrons anymore. You're selling molecules, right, and that's a different business. Um, but but what you avoid is that grid tie. Um, yeah. And then there's so other ones in terms of so for 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 hydrogen, right, you. You have to figure out how to deal with your variable power. You have to do that with, with other manufacturing as well. If you're tying into a direct manufacturing of any kind, uh, you have to figure out how to deal with that variable power and the best ways to do that um, for, for what's consuming it right on, right on site. Um, so a lot of work in, in, in um, you know, uh, automatic curtailment and moving from storage and just that whole kind of that system is, is where you're seeing that innovation in terms of you're not really changing anything mechanical in your turbine. Um, it's all in, the, in your controls. Um, uh, I can also kind of add some items on hydrogen and kind of some of the things that Orsted's doing. I know for us, a lot of times we're actually doing a grid tie and then um, uh, we'll have some sort of like hydrogen production site usually has like good water access down the road. I know uh, there's been some larger announcements about a project we're doing for uh, doing green fuels with Maersk, the large shipping company. Um, uh, and so with that, it's going to be based out of Texas where we're generating a lot of um, hydrogen production, uh, then creating uh, uh, methanol to be used to supply several Maersk's operations. And so with that, there's going to be like a central um, like green fuels production facility that's tied to the grid. And then you have like several different power plants that are supplying um, uh, that, like basically having a PPA with that site. And so um, we also have, uh, we have different hydrogen production um, uh, projects all across the world, um, and most of them are actually kind of a grid tied situation. But um, for example, we have a lot of uh, turbines out in the middle of the ocean, uh, and so with those, uh, some of them will be able to kind of maybe avoid the grid in some areas. So, kind of a mixed bag if uh, how you want to approach that. But like like you were saying, um, so trading electrons, you're trading molecules. So kind of uh, uh, you can get creative with it, which is nice. 
right. Any other? You want one more? Yeah, I'm going to put DJ on the spot just a bit. But so here you have two projects in a county that doesn't have planning and zoning. And so, Wayne County. So, how does your company go about that process relative to standards and setbacks and other things? And I'm sort of struck by the fact that you went ahead and, and had the additional expense of the lighting system, uh, although, you know, in Wayne County, they have no, not much requirements for anything. Uh, but maybe you could explain that process in Wayne County a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. And I want to caveat that, that I wasn't the developer in Wayne County, but I just kind of know how um, Orsted approaches things like this. Um, like, even though there's not planning and zoning, like there's, there's still going to be that county commission that you want to have a good relationship with and be able to make sure that everyone is on the same page. And so... Um, with that, a lot of those discussions come out of those meetings where instead of it being uh, in a, um, uh, instead of it being in like going through kind of a full public hearing process, you're working with those elected officials to make sure that you're, you're putting, putting this project together in a way that makes sense for the community. And so like some of those items are going to be like for us, we want to like come out and discuss the ADLS system. Other areas is we're going to be using county roads, so we want to be able to set up um, some sort of road use agreement. And so, um, those are the types of things that, like, whether there there is like kind of a formal planning and zoning process or not, um, uh, we'll, we'll still be working with those elected officials um, to be able to make sure that like this is being designed uh, in accordance so what the community wants via those elected officials and their preferences. And so um, additionally, there's a lot of coordination that happens with landowners where um, you have a lease with these landowners. Uh, they are voting members of the community. They have an interest in the sites. And they also have, uh, most of them, if not all of them, have like farming operations or some other use of the property. So. Um, you want to be able to make sure that you're designing the system that accommodates that. And, uh, and so that's an additional way of kind of like iterating the site layout and design and, and making sure this is designed properly. Uh, in addition to that, there's just kind of some, some industry standards for setbacks and, and designs throughout the sites um, so that um, you're kind of just aligning with industry standards. So that's kind of the way we'd approach it, um, at, at least from an Orsted perspective. Yeah, and then I can talk to a little bit about Invenergy. You know, we were talking about, you know, the additional expense of an ADLS system. Um, yes, it's an additional expense. It could be a customer um, ask that they want. Sometimes we have landowners that we will, you know, accommodate for. So, um, just because it is an extra cost, sometimes you want to have, you know, be a good neighbor. Uh, just to clarify your question, uh, it sounds like you're asking if basically instead of like continuing to increase the size, being able to keep a similar size but have a larger power output. Yeah, um, yeah, that's, uh, you're seeing that with GE. I know they have uh, kind of that 500, 500 mark is a pretty important mark uh, for a lot of these turbine manufacturers. And so um, you see GE has actually had, had over the years many different iterations of a turbine that's just shy of that 500 uh, feet mark that has an increased power output. So just on the technology, you're seeing that as well. I'm sure you'll continue to see that, whether it's blade design, some of the internal um, uh, mechanical engineering going on uh, to, to make it to where you have a higher power output. Additionally, like this, what, what's great about uh, the wind energy industry, it's a very mature industry. So we got years and years of experience and data to be able to rely on, on like, how do you best design these sites? So whether it's a turbine layout perspective to make sure that you're spacing turbines correctly to minimize waking effects, um, that is great as well because you can be able to maximize uh, that energy output uh, and the profitability of the site, profitability for the community um, without necessarily increasing um, 
the, the, the size as well. Um, so, yep, yeah, like you're absolutely seeing that um, in, in terms of kind of the, the future trends. Um, wish there was a turbine manufacturer here to be able to speak to kind of what the <laughs> what the the next step is, but um, yeah, you're definitely seeing that being eked out over time. Some of uh, just increased power output and increased energy output as well. Yeah, I would say I, recently I've started to see quotes up in the in the four and four plus megawatt range, um, under 500, which. Um, that's new over the last six years. I, I haven't really seen that before, but, but those, are, those are on market now. Yeah. Right. So relative to the increase in, in uh, capacity, uh, how much is the cut-in and cut-out speeds changed in the last number of years? How much is that having an impact? Is that part of it? I haven't seen much in terms of cutting and cutout speeds. Mostly that's been related from, from my experience, and I'll just speak to my experience. Um, that's been related to uh, bat mitigation. Um, you can increase your cut and speed as a way of reducing your, your impact on protected bat species. Um, as far as the larger turbines go, um, you know, your NCF is, is okay on those, but your, your power density is still very good. And so that allows you to go into places that you couldn't. This map, right, uh, which I just put up there because it's so dang beautiful. Uh, I wanted to see it large. Um, I have that in my office, but not that big. Um, you know, for us, that doesn't matter much because, well, we, we got a lot of purple, right? But there's a lot of parts of the country where you do need to get into lower density areas. Um, and those turbines are, are going to allow you to do that. Um, and that combined with the IRA, I think, is really going to achieve the goal of the IRA, which is really spreading wind power across the country. Do those uh, higher turbines, do they actually reduce the difference in percentage terms between the, the best sites and, less, uh, and sites with less effective wind resources? So, I think so. Um, and again, uh, that ties in with your tax credits, right? So, so where that allows you to look for lower sites, um, for lower wind sites, without a, a, a big loss, as particularly in your profitability and your PPA. Um, and so, whatever you lose in your power density, you make up in your total generation, and in in a uh, favorable uh, tax uh, regulatory environment, that all works out. You can go places that you hadn't thought. So, you know, uh, in the hydrogen area, uh, right, uh, with, with the IRA and particularly with the really striking subsidies for hydrogen that we're seeing, right, you're, what you're looking for is water availability and manufacturing much more than you're looking for that, that you know, fuchsia that we're so used to focusing on in terms of wind density. And to add on to that, um, so yeah, agreed that your your off taker, uh, in addition to just electrons, sometimes is going to be molecules. So being close to those uh, manufacturing sites, I know for example, uh, uh, Orsted has many assets in Texas near petrochemical facilities where hydrogen is used in refining every day, all the time, and so um, in addition to that, I, I think we're all pretty aware that a lot of the, um, the the low hanging fruit of somewhere that has really good transmission and a really good wind resource is uh, harder and harder to find. And so, uh, in addition to the uh, Inflation Reduction Act, kind of creating a a great tax regime that makes it favorable to go to these lower wind sites, um, the improvement in technology also helps accessing some of those lower wind speed sites that are maybe near some of these manufacturing areas or have that better transmission. So, um, yeah, it's really exciting to see that. All right. Well, thank you to our panelists for joining and uh, thank you for having us today. <laughs>